Hi, folks. Welcome to a very special Encore presentation of Enterprise Security Weekly. The host and production crew are taking the week off, so we're pulling episode 284 out of the vault. This one is called Zero to Full Domain Admin, the Real World Story of a Ransomware Attack. This is an interview with Joseph Carson, Chief Security Scientist and Advisory CISO at Delinea. I love real world stories about how attacks actually go down. They rarely resemble the kinds of things you see and read in the headlines. There are important nuances that have a big impact on how you'd actually prepare for incidents if you knew about them. I've interviewed Joseph Carson many times, and he's always a delight to talk to. I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Joseph joins us to talk about a real-world ransomware attack. Uh, he has 25 years of experience in enterprise security. It's a, it's a long time to do this gig. Uh, is an advisor to governments and several critical industries, and is also a podcast host for the 401 Access Denied podcast. Welcome to the show, Joseph. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited because it, I think this is an important topic uh, to share and there's a lot of lessons learned to go through uh, the the kind of the ransomware case that I'm going to share with the audience today. So I'm really, I'm really excited, and it's it's great to be chatting with you uh, again as well. So it's always fun. Yeah, same. You, you know, we we talk a lot about the industry and products and and things here. And as a former industry analyst, you know, you you talk a lot in in theoreticals and hypotheticals. You know, so it's always fun to have some some real real world examples. I actually spent a lot of my spare time uh, studying uh, uh, breaches and and doing kind of post mortems on breaches where we have uh, good details available. So so I love and, and I used to be an incident responder. You know, so so I love a good uh, incident response story. Absolutely, and for me, one of the important things here is that it's really about. Kind of sharing the you know the step by step how, how everything gets connected as well, and very seldom as well you know like yourself I, I've done quite a, a lot of incident response and digital forensics I've also on the other side of the fence doing penetration testing and ethical hacking, uh, but for me you know getting permission to share the experience because uh, very seldom do I get you know we we tend to send sign these long NDAs that typically forbid us from from talking about any aspects uh, of the cases. Uh, but for this particular one, the actually victim wanted to share their story. They wanted to share their experience. They have you know, asked me to remove certain aspects of it that would you know, reveal location, company, and so forth. But they want to share the experience of, of the incident response, what lessons they learned, the attack techniques that the attackers used, um, what happened in the recovery process. And they wanted to share, so they want to make other companies aware of the techniques that's used so that they can avoid other companies becoming a victim like they did. And I think that's really important. I think we should be doing more of that. We should be doing more transparency um, and you know, removing the sense of things where possible. But the more we learn about how things connect, how the incident, how the techniques is used, what things could have prevented it, uh, what things could have discovered it much earlier. I think those are some of the important things that other companies will hopefully learn for, from today's session as well. Yeah, and it, it's it's my wish that we get to the point to where ultimately sharing those kinds of details is required. You know, and any kind of situation where human safety uh, comes into it, be it maritime uh, incidents, uh, aviation incidents, uh, you, you know, highway incidents, things like that. You know, we detailed uh, incident report, re reports are publicly available so that we can learn from these things, or, or at least available to the people that that need to review them. So that safety measures can be improved, and we just don't have that uh, with cybersecurity at this point. And I think um, I don't know what, what it's going to take. I, I don't know if it takes bodies, you know, to be blunt about it. But uh, but yeah, I, I, I do think we need to get there. And I love the fact that this particular uh, victim wanted to share their experience so that others can learn. Absolutely. So just going to give you some of the background, um, the particular ransomware case, it relates to the Crylock version of ransomware. So Crylock is the version two of what was previously called Cryacle. 
uh, Cryacle was kind of around in, in circulation as a ransomware variant around, I think it was about 2017, 2018. And then after um, it was discovered to have a weakness in the encryption, it disappeared for a while. Uh, and then it resurfaced late 2020, um, where it basically came back in as basically an updated and improved version, which was Crylock 2.0. And of course, the weaknesses in the encryption had been, you know, completely, you know, been removed and, and it had significantly improved, not just in its encryption capability, but also its performance um, in regards to how fast it can encrypt the machine. A lot of uh, machines I saw probably took around three to four minutes in total. And those were machines that had, you know, hundreds of gigs of data. Um, so very, very fast, uh, very efficient. And also, you know, looking at the, I did some dynamic analysis and some stati static analysis to determine um, some of the potential maybe command and controls or IP uh, or encryption technology capabilities. Uh, but it was very, very difficult to kind of reverse engineer it. So it was very well developed um, and very efficient what it was actually doing. Yeah, so, you know, I think you wanted to kind of tell this story from two different perspectives. You know, right. so yeah, yeah. So it's it's uh, and also I think we should mention, you know, this is a this is a talk that you gave at RSA, and uh, and are you giving it again? Is that correct? Or absolutely. So this is a talk that I gave recently um, at RSA, and I'll be actually uh, doing the talk again at InfoSec World uh, 2022 in uh, Orlando. Um, so I'm actually, you know, in September. So I'm really excited. And one of the differences that I do when I'm doing the talk is I give some context around it, but one of the things I do when I'm delivering it is actually I do the live demonstration. I actually take it from, you know, the start right through to the end um, and all the steps. I even share the, the details of the scripts that was used and the techniques the attackers used in order to elevate privileges, to move around the network, to discover sensitive systems, and ultimately deploy the ransomware itself. Uh, so I share all of these steps and details right from the beginning, right through to the end. And as you mentioned, I usually do take two different approaches to this particular talk. Uh, one is I show it from the attacker's perspective. And when the attackers come up against certain, let's say, aspects um, or you know blockers or challenges that they need to kind of evolve or, or work around, uh, so I show kind of some of the steps that they, they took from that perspective. Um, also, some of the methods for using for persistence. And then I also show it from the answer response perspective, because I think it's really important also to show how you can find what's what things to look for. What's the indicators of compromise? Um, what was it like to you know collect the evidence? Because uh, if you th you're thinking about when you're dealing with ransomware, uh, one of the challenges that you have is that a lot of the evidence is actually deleted and, and encrypted. Um, the attackers actually really look to make sure that the event logs are, are, are cleared, that they make sure that the uh, logs, that the specific you know data has been encrypted as well. So you, typically there's very little evidence remaining. And I always compare it to almost being like given, you know, as an instant responder, given a, a 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle, and you've only got 200 pieces remaining, and you need to basically put all of those remaining pieces and try to understand what was the big picture. How what staging machines were used? How did they move around the network? And it's very difficult, especially when you have very little evidence. So for me, it's uh, one of the things I used, which was actually quite interesting, was I actually used the actually event log clearing event <laughs> as the method to find the staging machine. So I actually mm -hmm. uh, took all of the data um, and I basically put it into log to timeline. Uh, so Plasso is a set of tools that we use basically for, for evidence gathering and, and correlating of, of events. So I took all of those and I specifically looked for the timeline. And I actually looked for the first instance of the actually clearing event log. And that's how I was able to create a hierarchy in the chain of events to find the staging machine um, by actually using using the event log clearing event uh, to find that. So it was quite interesting kind of some of the steps and some of the uh, you know uh, lessons learned. But this particular, the incident, you know, when you gathered, I gathered around five years of log data. That's how far I went back in order to do the mm -hmm. investigation. And with that five years of data, um, what I uncovered was the actually attack started seven months prior. So it actually seven months before the actually uh, ransomware, you know, de deployment and, and uh, delivery, uh, the attack actually started where it was basically, it looked like an access broker. Um, that had basically was scanning the internet, you know, using search engines and scanning for different open ports. And they discovered an open port um, that they end up doing either 
Uh, the actual particular version of the server was also vulnerable as well, but I didn't find any evidence of the particular vulnerability that was uh, um, vulnerable to was uh, the uh, uh, Eternal Blue. Um, but typically when you're looking at that, it tends to have some crashes or some evidence of, of uh, instability. Um, and I didn't find ev any evidence of that, but it did appear that more likely to being a brute force or that the actually a victim um, had had a compromised password. So from that perspective, you know, seven months prior, from that seven months up until where the attackers got hands on keyboard, there was only three instances of that credential being used successfully. Successful logon, and then it went basically quiet for a couple of months. Successful logon, then it went quiet for a few more months. And then two weeks prior to the attack, to the hands-on keyboard, there was another successful logon. And then it looked like the actually access brokers had then sold those credentials to other cyber criminals who then used it and logged on. Um, basically, finding that staging machine was critical because it was able to find some of the techniques and some of the tools the attackers used. One thing that was very interesting that they used was GMER. Uh, GMER is something you know we use. Uh, basically, as a security tool, it, it helps us find rootkits in the kernel, you know, uh, hidden drivers and filter drivers and mini filter drivers. Um, what the attackers were actually using GMER for was to find what security products was running on the systems that they may not have seen running in the taskbar or running in processes that might be hidden. They were actually using that to basically look for what security products was actually defending uh, so that they could find what ways they could actually move around or or stay hidden or not trigger those security products or find ways in order to actually uh, turn them off. So that was really interesting kind of aspect of uh, using tools that we use for good that have been used in order to to, right. to stay hidden as well. Right. I mean, essentially, they're extra administrators at this point. So they're using administrative tools as... Mm -hmm you know, uh, non-approved, <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not, not approved uses. It's, it's for, for, for they're using it in order. Basically they like living off the land. Um, yeah. very seldom do attackers want to introduce anything new because introducing anything new will increase their, you know, uh, potential detection or, or, or the, you know, defenders being able to discover something. Um, so they tend to prefer to live off the land, uh, and use tools that basically would look like normal activity. Uh, to any other administrator. You know, even PS exact was used in this particular case as well uh, in order to move around the network. So, so you know, this is something uh, that they want to, to stay stealthy. They don't want to be discovered. They like to stay hidden for as long as possible, creating as little noise. So, so on that, on that point, um, before you go much deeper, mm -hmm. you know, let, let's uh, highlight the initial access brokers here a bit, because I, you know, I think that's part of uh, understanding the business behind the criminal side of things here in that you have these initial access brokers that kind of specialize in going out and getting that initial foothold and then they try and auction that off i guess or or, or sell that you know but I, th I think it might be a bit confusing to people to hear that the initial intrusion was seven months and then nothing happens and then all of a sudden the the actual in incident occurs Absolutely. In, in this, we estimated that there was four different criminal gangs that actually participated in this particular attack. You had one as the access brokers, who specifically, uh, you know, gained access and sold it on to other criminals. So they weren't necessarily the same ones that actually logged on to the computers. They just basically, you know, find the credentials and the expert. That's what they specialize in, and that's all they make their money off. Um, is the access itself. The other group was the crypto creators, the, the ones who actually developed the uh, Crylock. They were, you know, sold it off. It was one of the first, I always, interesting, it was one of the first ransomware variants that was more of a ransomware as a service. What they refer to as an affiliate program, where rather than them deploying the ransomware, what they do is they, you know, they have a channel. They literally employ a channel who basically will basically give them back uh, loyalty or, you know, financial return uh, for successful like ransomware sales. victims, a sales channel. Yep, that's a sales channel for for ransomware. Um, and then also the other, you had the, those who logged on to 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 the systems and ultimately, you know, did the hands-on keyboard work. And then the other was also the, the ones who communicated. Um, they employed, uh, you know, help desk workers in order to actually communicate because English wasn't their native language. Um, so in order, you know, they become basically. A you know a support team for them to want us communicate 
and help the victims you know, uh, to verify that they can decrypt the data if they want to basically go down that path of, of paying the ransom um, and also the communication channel. Uh, sometimes the attackers are not in the same time zone and they don't want to be basically, you know, uh, you know, basically staying up their, their late nights. So they will have an intermediary do the communication for them. Yeah, I went to a supply chain. Go ahead, John. Uh, I was just saying it gives a new meaning to supply chain, right? Like it's it's the the diversity and what's actually <laughs> tied together. It's um, I think yeah. in some in some cases some of these organizations are getting more sophisticated than the the enterprises are compromising. I was going to say it gives new meaning to MBA, more like. <laughs> Uh, malware business administration. <laughs> Absolutely, we've even seen uh, you know crypto creators actually doing bug parties now <laughs> to find vulnerabilities in their own software. Um, so wow. it's also interesting, kind yeah, of the, yeah. the path. I have seen, that. Uh, and they do they do have recruiting processes as well. Um, and interesting, uh, the the uh, organized crime and cyber crime uh, groups. Uh, they don't require much certifications <laughs> as well. So um, the path to 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 that you know direction is sometimes easier than getting into the industry. Um, so it was always interesting, you know, it, the, the thing was that looking through this case, it was always kind of, you know, uncovering those little details and uncovering the very specifics of, you know, the multiple groups that you're dealing with. Um, it was also, you know, getting into even negotiating. Uh, one of the things that uh, the organization, uh, as the, it was an early Sunday morning when the ransomware was deployed. And at the same time, they were actually extracting uh, a large database. Uh, and that's probably enough, not a coincidence. That timing, right? Early on a Sunday morning. It was. It was not a coincidence. Yeah, that was definitely something that they planned because it has the biggest impact, and the very little people watching or looking at monitoring of logs or looking at events. So um, that's a definitely a way to have the biggest impact when you've got very few people to be able to respond quickly. So um, one, that's one of the things that you know, and also how you discover. I find a lot of different cases how you discover your victim. In this particular case, the actually attackers, you know, they actually had the IT and security teams email addresses, telephone numbers, um, contacts, social media information. Um, they actually sent uh, emails and SMSs uh, to the IT team to let them know that they've been become a victim. Um, so, so you know, they want <laughs> they want you to know um, because ultimately that's how, you know how they basically let you know that they've got all the details and how much uh, you know data they've been able to access as well especially when it's the it team's credentials that te the attackers have access to and are using wow and, and they create that sense of urgency right absolutely you know, it's a sense of urgency yeah. because once they notify you the clock's ticking and that's what's important mm -hmm. is a lot of the cryptos uh the, you know, the 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 ransomware itself once you actually deploy it the clock starts ticking um so it's important you know especially if the ransomware of the guy themselves who is actually uh, deploying it, if they're if they've obtained it from other locations like other uh, you know uh, malware creators, that once they deploy it, that clock starts ticking and they have no control over it, um, and that typically means that in two days' time there's a negotiation of of basically that you'll get a fifty percent discount off the actually ransomware, um, and then after four days it's full payment, and then after uh, a few more days after that, then basically the keys are are, are gone. Um, so that starts basically the, the severity of the impact and, and time is so critical to respond. You have to respond, you have to start already, you know, getting very, very quick, uh, response, you know, within minutes, literally, you know, 30 minutes is ideal to really get all hands on board and responding, uh, where you can actually make sure that you sever the connection, the active connection, the attackers might have rotating the credentials to make sure they can't return. Um, and ultimately then doing, you know, the investigation and finding where that, uh, you know, patient zero is to make sure you lock the door. Unfortunately for this particular victim, um, they, they they had a backup solution, but the backup was on a flat network using the same credentials as production. Um, wow. So ultimately, it was also online, meaning that when the attackers were able to gain access to the actually a domain administrator account, they were able to also uh, encrypt the backup as well. So this organization ultimately was facing that their completely business was gone. The business that they had, the backup, production, all the customer data, all the financial data. And that means inventory of what you have in stock, um, how to, you know, you can't even pay your employees or pay your suppliers. Um, you can't send out invoices to even get paid because all of that's gone. You know, the business came to complete stop. They were at the point where basically they were looking at what paper 
they had to be able to continue providing services. Um, so it was quite devastating. Um, and they did go through the process um, of considering whether to pay the ransom or not. For me, uh, you know, we hear, we can go to events and we, we hear this from the, the industry so often is to not pay the ransom, but we're not, we're not in the position to say that. We can only recommend it, but we can't enforce it. We have to get to the point where it's a business decision. Um, and the business will decide whether they will go down the path of paying the ransom or not. Um, and I think that's the right thing to do. And ultimately, you know, paying the ransom in the end does fuel future, you know, cyber crime and it makes the, big, the problem bigger. Um, but ultimately, it, it is a business decision. We can't uh, in, in, in interfere with that. We have to let the business decide what is their path to, to recovery. Um, and it's our job to make sure either that we mitigate it for the future, that they don't become a victim again. That's ultimately what we're here to do is reduce that risk. Um, fortunately enough, we very quickly, you know, find that the, as I went through basically the inventory and all the details, and I did that uh, going back five years of data, I was able to find that a year ago they had actually done a migration and uh, that migration was critical. It meant that we were able to go back to that that system that was still available, that was one year old, um, uh, that had been basically it was a hardware migration and a software upgrade at the same time. And fortunately enough, that machine, which was due to be decommissioned, <laughs> and just the team didn't have the time to do it, that it was still available. So we were fortunate enough that we used that as a baseline to recreate the business. And of course, we had to go through and do the migration again, do the software update. But it meant that the business had only lost one year's worth of data still devastating to the business but that was something that they could use as a baseline to recover from that was something that we then could go through all the paper receipts um what was left in email accounts um what was left in basically hard drives and do a lot of data scraping and it took them i think it was around ultimately i mean there was more than 20 plus people working on this particular incident and it took around two and a half months to three months to rebuild to get that business back in a, in a, in a, a you know uh, to a prior incident operational mode. Um, but it would end up that particular, uh, you know, being able to find that one-year-old machine uh, meant that the cost of the recovery was less than what the ransomware payment would have been. Uh, so they were quite fortunate. Um, I, was, I, I would go to say they were actually very lucky um, that they did have some of the things, you know, that was there to, to be able to, to have a baseline for to recover the business. Uh, but ultimately, so you know, this was in the hundred thousands of euros. Um, of yeah. costs, where the ransom so, payment itself would have been in the millions. So the the overall timeline of this, um, you know, so seven months before the the attack really begins after initial access, um, and then you said uh, to around two and a half months for the recovery. How long was mm -hmm. the actual investigation point from from when the attack started to when uh, you were hired and, and you know you got to the point where you had containment eradication and and started rebuilding absolutely so so basically from the seven months that the initial access it was hands-on keyboard for approximately 15 days so the attackers had hands-on keyboard um, where they were enumerating elevating credentials uh, uh, they were able to find local administrator accounts that they were then able to uh, disable to security in the system uh, lure a domain administrator to log on to that system and gain access to their credentials ultimately elevating right up the domain admin that uh, process took around two weeks, so uh, 15 days. Um, after 15 days of hands-on keyboard is when they started extracting the data. And when they got the domain administrator, they had uh, then basically, that was only a matter of hours before they deployed the ransomware. And they created multiple staging machines in order to, to make that deployment quite effective and quite efficient. Um, so that was around you know, 15 days. The incident happened within literally minutes after the ransomware started being uh, deployed and the attackers contacted the IT team directly to let them know that they become a victim. Um, the investigation itself, um, I think my involvement was probably around total, you know, I wasn't permanently on the case. I was more oversight uh, and making sure that they had all the necessary uh, kind of uh, tools and techniques and processes. Uh, from total from ransomware deployment to the recovery, was around three months, um, and the incident response took around a full two weeks, uh, two weeks of investigation to find out all the details, to lock the doors, uh, to eradicate. Um, so that was uh, around a two-week process. 
and that, that's not a normal two weeks either when, when you're going it's through that the process. clock that, it is run yeah. the clock it is stressful um, that's a life you know for for the team i mean for me it was a realization that I, you know when i start seeing uh burnout um you start seeing people getting post traumatic stress you start seeing you know people you know getting a really imbalance and and ultimately these types of incidents are when you start seeing people leave the industry uh which is unfortunate and and i think that when people's working as a response we really need to start thinking about the human element of it which means that we have to think about psychology and therapies for the people who's responding to these incidents because it is very stressful these are people that's working on cases where they don't know they'll have a job at the end of it um because in many cases what happens is that there's human victimizing um organizations prefer to have a human uh, as a you know as a way to to create blame um so so th these teams are working under very very uh, severe stress um uh, run the clock um so you think about you know it's uh, from a two-week period it, it is uh, the longest period that you know, most people experience very, very stressful circumstances. It's funny. This is um, our, our two guests today are sort of nicely aligned. I, I'm not sure if, if you're able to listen to a previous one, but a lot of sort of what you've been talking through, um, he was talking from a threat hunter aspect of mm -hmm. um, how how he goes about actually trying to find some of these things and and um, mitigate them before they ha happen. Hopefully, versus you talking about the actual IR side of things. Um, I don't know, not quite so much a question, but it, it's interesting to sort of compare and contrast. He actually seemed very, um, I don't know, Adrian, if you had this, seemed very laid back and they talked about, we don't have metrics on what we're doing. We just sort of try and find like the new things coming up. And it was a, um, it seemed like a very nice working environment compared to, um, you know, there's, there's definitely something to be said for the adrenaline rush of being in that moment. But I can imagine if you're in it constantly that, um, that, yeah. I, you know, burnout's a perfect word. Yeah, no, I, 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 I think. Yeah, go ahead, Adrian. I, I was going to say you definitely, if you're going to do it long term, you have to have a personality for it. I, I thrive off it. Like a, one of my favorite jobs was uh, working in restaurants as a chef, and <laughs> like like <laughs> you don't have a chance to go to the bathroom. Like nobody else works your station but you, you know. And it, it's just uh, you know however long that shift is, just six hours of just nonstop. You know, and, and that just uh, that feeds me. I love it, and yeah. uh, and, and I, I really enjoyed incident response for that also. But you know, I I, I did uh, you know I learned a lot of the prep we had to do were for the folks that were not like that. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of the prep had to be okay. Like you've you know you've put in a shift. You need to go away and stop thinking about this, and you know, understanding other people need to recharge. You know, they, they, they have different needs, you know, than, than people that, that kind of enjoy the, the adrenaline and, and being, being in this moment and can be calm and not stressed out in that moment. Absolutely. It, it is very, I mean, one of the things I do recommend is in its response, it is great to have uh, a red teamer on the instant response team because they really know what to look for. They can think like the attacker, they can look for the paths. Um, so I think it's, you know, purple teaming is a great way, but we definitely need you know these teams to work together and come together um so definitely when you're doing this response having somebody who can think like an attacker and can follow those breadcrumbs and work the way back and finding out what's the possibilities of the attackers getting access that's so crucial it's so critical um and those skill sets are very different um you know when you're looking at instant response and digital forensics it's a very different you know they're looking at logs they're looking at building ports and, and understanding um, but sometimes they don't have the, the mindset of the attacker. And I think it's so important, you know, I, I did listen to a bit of the previous uh, speaker and it was great hearing some of the, the concepts. And I think having, having that cross pollination, cross knowledge sharing is so critical to, to really getting it, to organizations more resilient and better prepared. Yeah, and, and to your point, uh, John, we, we do try to match up uh, interviews that work well together. So our first <laughs> interview today was, uh, if you look at the cyber defense matrix that so Neil you put together, our first guest was right of boom, and uh, and the, you know Joseph is left of boom. Or no, I got that I got that reversed. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, let, if you're looking at the the matrix, you know left of boom is uh, you know. Uh, identification and preparation or, or prevention, uh, mm -hmm. you know, before any kind of incident occurs. And then on the other side, you have detection, response, and recovery. 
you know, so that one thing, in, one thing I do want to, yeah. One thing I do want to share with you, Adrian, was that uh, what was interesting when I was doing the investigation as well, uh, you do uncover other things, which is always interesting. One thing that oh, um, yeah. I did uncover or going back was that when I, I, I might say I went five years back in the logs and events to do the, the, the super timeline, um, I did find evidence of other crimes in the business. Um, uh, somebody had uh, installed crypto mining software in the business, and that had been running for two years. So an somebody an employee, who right? had access, uh, an employee um, had installed crypto mining software and had been basically, uh, you know, living off that for for quite a number of years. And when we did the cost analysis into the uh, power consumption, it was high. <laughs> it was quite expensive. So that was one thing that was interesting. That you do find, of course, in my case, I document it and I pass it over and let the organization decide how they want to deal with it. But what was also very interesting was that when I was going through and I had the evidence remaining from the attackers, one is they, they, they had up to, you know, five different ransomware uh, variants they could have chosen from. So they, they, you know, they had a whole basically tool set of ransomware. But what they'd done was they'd done a, a lot of copy pasting in their scripts. And I was able to then find that when the actually logs and the evidence that I was able to, to, to get into, that I did find evidence of another victim. So for me, I thought it was quite interesting. So I got permission to go and contact this other victim. Um, so I reached out, I thought it was proactive, you know, as a good ethical hacker to go and notify this other organization that I'm sitting looking at their, you know, domain controllers and looking at their, uh, you know, usernames and passwords and hashes. And I thought, you know, I should, I should do the, my, you know, due diligence and contact them. So I reached out and I contacted them. I said, Hey, I'm working this other case here and I find evidence of your data in this case. Um, maybe, you know, have you become a victim of ransomware recently? And maybe you want to collaborate or, you know, share indicators of compromise. And uh, they responded very quickly and said, we are not a victim of ransomware. Um, and that was it. And I thought, huh, okay. Well, then I, then I responded back and said, maybe this is a good time. Maybe they don't know. Maybe they're about to deploy it. Maybe this is where you can stop it before it happens. So I said, you know, maybe, you know, you're actually lucky. Maybe you can start investigating and seeing. Uh, it, is, isn't that the is first stage of grief? <laughs> is, is denial is denial the first stage okay, so just so, absolutely um and ultimately so I, so I a second time i said hey and after that it went silence nothing and as you know after uh, a period it was two and a half months later and that came to the point where i had to then you know take all my evidence all the hard drives everything that i'd worked on forensically and then it was getting basically archived it was getting uh, replicated and then you know passed over to law enforcement um, and uh, at that point in time, I thought, well, well I, since I know this contains evidence of another organization, I actually contacted them for a third time. I read it, in it almost two and a half months later after initially contacting them. And uh, I said, hey, just to let you know that, you know, my investigation is concluded and I'm handing over the evidence to law enforcement and it will contain information related to your organization. Immediately afterwards, I received a response that, yes, uh, we had become a victim and that they paid the ransom and they didn't want anyone to know. And to this date, there still is no evidence of that organization ever ever be, being a victim. Um, and uh, it's a very large organization. So I think that that scenario is is very common. And it's unfortunate that, that we don't hear more about it uh, because I think it's really important that we, we become transparent um, and share experiences yeah. Because that's definitely it's the lessons learned that I'm sharing today. Hopefully, that others will be able to to you know in the future prevent them in themselves from becoming victims. Absolutely, and, and and that's really where where I'd like to leave this is is kind of that uh, you know that call to action to yeah I, I don't know what we have to do to make it happen. You know, it's great that individual organizations decide to share. Um, yeah, you know, there have been many great cases of that in in the past. A lot of uh, startups that had a very transparent culture, you know, the kinds of startups where like they publish everybody's salary anyway, you know, they, they talk a lot about uh, business strategy and stuff like that, you know, but, um, but yeah, yeah, we, we, we need to understand these things, you know, to be able to, to make bigger, bigger steps forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. For the the audience. Yeah. For the audience of the, I mean, I, I will do a live demo with this at InfoSec world. So, if you happen to to get an opportunity to go to that to that that conference and event, um, you know, feel free to come to the session because I I I loved I will be doing it live. Um, so uh, and I always enjoy that part of it. Yeah, I mean, the only way you can make it more real is 
if there was like a documentary crew uh, present while you were doing the incident. And I would 100% watch that documentary. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, Joseph, thanks so much for joining us on Enterprise Security Weekly today. Many thanks. It's been a pleasure. And for everyone, you know, hopefully this is educational and uh, hopefully to see you again in the future and stay safe.